Welcome to the Da Vinci Hour podcast, presented by Da Vinci Academy. I am your host, Dr. Maxwell Cooper. This episode is a part of our Da Vinci Innovators series, which feature physicians, inventors, and entrepreneurs working on innovative medical technology. Our guests for these episodes discuss developing new medical technology, building med tech companies, and advice for anyone going through the process of medical innovation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Da Vinci Hour podcast. I am very honored this week to be joined by Dr. Gary Michelson. Dr. Michelson is an orthopedic spine surgeon, a prolific medical device inventor with over 900 patents issued worldwide, and more recently has become a very active philanthropist out in California. So, Dr. Michelson, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time today. It's my great pleasure, Max. So I kind of want to go back to the beginning of your career uh, and curious, as a medical student, why did you choose orthopedic surgery? And I'm curious if the opportunity to develop devices in orthopedics was kind of a part of that decision. No, it's actually interesting. When I was a, a little boy, um, I came home from grammar school one day. In those days, it was actually safe to walk. I think we used to walk about six blocks to school. And I went to my grandmother's house for lunch. And I remember she was making macaroni and cheese and uh, she had a disease called syringomyelia. You're a physician, so you know what that is, but essentially it's a syrinx or a, like a balloon full of water right in the middle of your spinal cord that as it expands, crushes the long tracks that basically go up the spinal cord to and from the brain. And so they usually selectively destroy the perception of pain and temperature. So here I am a little boy, and I start to smell something pretty horrible. And I look over and my grandmother, who's talking to me, is leaning her arm on the stove and her arm is on fire. Oh, my goodness. And she's just casually talking to me. I mean, it's just a horrifying scene. And I'm screaming. And then she goes up to the sink and she puts her arm in the sink. And she wraps it with a wet tail. Now, she's not feeling any pain because she has no perception of pain or temperature. But you could still smell the flesh burning. And then she said to me, and I, this is kind of a joke if you're Jewish, but the question always is, if you're Jewish, when does a fetus become a human being? And the answer is when it graduates from medical school. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit of an in-joke if you're Jewish. So my grandmother says to me, oh, it's okay. You'll just become a spine doctor and fix me. Now, I don't know what you know by game theory, but the whole idea is that these little decisions you make early in life really control the direction of your life. And well, and other people were going to college or they're going, I already knew I was going pre-med. I knew I was going to go to medical school. I knew I was going to be a spine doctor. And that's what I ended up doing. That's an amazing story. I mean, that's, you know, having that early inspiration as a child and have, and really caring, you know, many people are inspired young, but to actually carry out that, you know, that mission uh, is pretty, pretty incredible. And then obviously what you did to further the, not only practice spine surgery, but further the field of spine surgery. It's simply amazing. I'm so curious. Max, let me, let me just tell you a funny uh, yeah, of course. story. So when I was in my residency and I would say to my professors that I, I would scrub in on every spine surgery. All the other residents didn't want to because they're long operations. Like a two level fusion back then was a six, seven hour operation. Scoliosis was even longer. They'd all go, you want to do my operation? I'd go, yeah, sure. So, um, that, that was going on. And then um, these guys said to me, they go, why do you always scrub in all these? I said, because I want to be a spine surgeon. And I remember one of them looking at me and they went, you know, I thought you were a bright guy. Why in the world would you go into something where you do the operations just exactly like you're supposed to do them? And half the time the patients get better and half the time they don't. And some of the ones that don't get better get worse. And, and that was the state of the art. Um, in the 1970s. So it was an, an area that turned out to be very fertile for innovation. That's pretty cool. That's amazing. I mean, it's from what I know of spine surgery, it certainly has come a long way. And from what I've read, your your early inventions certainly played a, a pivotal role in that. I'm curious, when you, when you got out into practice, did you practice in more of like an academic setting or a private practice? So um, this is a little anecdote. So if you're sitting in Philadelphia where the skies are gray for the entire winter and you're turning on the TV and you see the Beach Boys concert in California and everybody's in their T-shirts and waving around the sun, you say to yourself, you know, when I get the chance, I think I'll go to California. So when I finished, I did a fellowship in spine surgery, which were fairly 
infrequent back then. That meant that you finished a residency and for a period of time, you did nothing but spine surgery um, with a master spine surgeon, much like somebody would learn to make a violin by going to a master violin maker. And those were fairly unusual. And then from there, I moved to California. So when I got to California, it was interesting because the neurosurgeons, particularly where I was, thought they owned the spine. Now, that was particularly interesting because they did no fusions. All they did was decompressions. But they thought that an orthopedic surgeon shouldn't be allowed to operate on the spine. So that was a, an interesting situation when I first started out. They would not, they tried to not even let me be able to do a myelogram or order a myelogram to try to shut me down wow. so that I couldn't do spine surgery. So I had to overcome that. And I actually was in a hospital that was famous, but it was more famous for uh, being the center of sports medicine. There was a group there called the Job and Curling Group. And they were okay. taking care of the Lakers, the Dodgers, the Kings, the Rams. You know, it went on and on. So that's why that particular hospital was famous. And that's where I did most of my work. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and I'm curious, when, how did you get into inventing? Was that something you had done as a child or, or as a medical student or a resident? Or was that something you more started doing when you got out in practice? Again, it's going to be that same game theory answer about the stuff that happens early in life. Um, but I remember being maybe seven or eight years old and seeing a record player, if anybody knows what those are, uh, sitting on top of a trash can. And it looked pretty good. So I took it home. I took it apart. And I said, oh, wow, this is why this is not working. And it really wasn't all that complicated. And I fixed the piece that wasn't working. And here I was. I was a young kid at a record player. And then um, I remember I was homesick. I was still just you know, in grammar school. And my parents said, well, you can stay home sick. And we're not sure how sick you really are, but don't watch television. So the moment they went out, I turned on the television. And as I'm watching it, it goes dark. And I go, this is not going to turn out well. <laughs> I get dressed. No, seriously, I get dressed. And in those days, I mean, it shows how old I am. You could go down to sort of the five and 10 corner store in your neighborhood. And they would have a machine that you could test tubes on because TVs back then had tubes. And it wasn't really hard to figure out which tube was bad. It wasn't glowing anymore. I mean, this was not rocket science. So all the tubes are lit up, one of them's dark. So you took it down, you put it in the machine, didn't work, and they'd have a replacement. You came back home, you put it back in, you put it back on the TV, and everything's good again. So it became pretty clear that things were, at least in those days, straightforward. Um, and, and once you realize you actually can fix things, it makes you want to do it. It's a very rewarding experience. So then as a kid, um, I started doing things with electricity and my parents were both scared of electricity. And now you know, as long as you don't touch both ends of the two wires, you're okay. So um, everything along the way continued to encourage me. And then I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but when I was doing my fellowship, I saw a particular case. In fact, I was doing the surgery where I was just totally dissatisfied with the status quo. It was a young woman who we took out a ruptured disc, but after I took out the soft gooey stuff, it had been a slow prolonged rupture that had lifted the periosteum off the back of the vertebrae and left this horn, just like a rhinoceros horn right underneath the nerve root. And you could see the root draped over it. And I said to the gentleman who ran the program that time, who was a pretty world famous spine surgeon, and named Alex Brodsky, I said, Alex, what do you want to do with that? And he said, do not do anything. He said, I once tried to bite one of those off with a ronjure, which is a long, skinny instrument that bites. And he said, the end of it, the bone was so hard, it exploded in the spine. It took me two hours to get the pieces out of the dural sac. I just said, so don't do that. And he said, and I, he named this surgeon, who I won't name, who was a, another world famous surgeon. He said, he put a burr in there and tried to burr it and wound up somebody's spinal cord and paralyzed them for life. He said, so since the first edict of Medicine is first do no harm. He said, just close the patient up and leave that alone. That was a very unsatisfying situation. And sure enough, when I got into private practice, I saw the exact same thing. And I figured out a way to deal with it safely. And that's become the way everybody deals with it now. And so that encouraged me from the beginning to not accept things the way they were. That's an amazing story. I mean, even as a trainee, you're seeing things that 
you know, they just don't look right. You know, you're still in that early phase or you're still learning, but yet something just didn't seem right. That's amazing. So I'm curious, um, what was your, was your first invention in spine surgery? What, what, well, that device? was it. So, so, you know, but two point George Bernard Shaw said that inventors are a disgruntled lot. He said, all the rest of us can just accept things the way they are. He said, but inventors try to change the world to suit themselves. And therefore, all progress depends on the disgruntled. That was his famous quote. But it's true. I mean, when, as a surgeon, I would struggle. I wouldn't be arrogant. I would turn to the people who supposedly were the best in the world. And I'd call them up and say, well, what would you do? And they go, nothing. Leave that alone. Or I go, wait a second. That's, that's not a good answer. And, and there were better ways to do things. And that gave me the opportunity for all those inventions. And those are the things we're all doing today. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm curious during your early days as a physician inventor, you know, how did you, did you build the prototypes yourself? And I guess, how did you fund all of this as, as well? Yeah, that's a question people ask me a lot. Like, do you go get government money or, you know, I was fortunate enough. I was a, a doctor and all doctors make a decent living. I don't care how much they complain. They make a decent living. I didn't have a family. I lived in a small apartment. So I just, would go to a particular machinist that I trust. I would give him drawings. He'd make something. And, and the good thing was I was in a position to try the things in a safe way and to learn from them. You don't succeed usually the first time around, but if you can see things and derive the meaning of what you're seeing, then the thing itself teaches you. And, and the inventing is an iterative process. But as Land uh, pointed out, it's usually iterative and reverse. It becomes simpler and simpler and simpler. And when the solution seems profoundly simple, you've arrived at the right solution. Interesting. Interesting. So I'm curious, what what were, how would you describe your, I, I realize with 900 patents, it's a wide, it could be a wide variety, but what, what tips of types of devices did you like to invent? Where is it like pedicle screws or fusion plates or some of the surgical kits? I guess, what type of devices uh, did you like to invent? Okay, so that's interesting because you name things that all already existed, and then people will, of course, try to improve upon them or come up with variations of them. I tried to never do that. That was never an impetus for me. I was always trying to solve an unsolved problem, and as a matter of patent law, there are essentially two kinds of patents. There are what are called pioneering patents that describe something that simply never existed before or there's improvement patents that say okay i acknowledge that but this is a, a better version or it does something that one didn't and so most of my um efforts were directed to do things that really had not been done before so i give you a, a wave example i don't want to be too long-winded about this when i trained uh, in my residency and even during my fellowship uh, one of the most common things you deal with are instabilities at the very bottom of the spine, which is not a surprise. That's where the maximum loads are. And that's where you're doing all that bending and flexing. So it's not uncommon to want to mechanically stabilize the last two disc levels in the spine, L4, L5, and L5, S1. And the way that that was being done during my training was that usually you'd go from behind and you'd basically denude the skeleton to look like a skeleton hanging on a rack somewhere. You take all the muscles off, all the tendons off. You're just looking at bone. You would take out usually the ruptured disc because it usually was a ruptured disc. And then you would have to try to trick the body into thinking that you had three broken bones so that when it went to heal the three bones, you would bridge that with more bone that you got from somewhere else. And it would all heal as like one big mass, like concrete setting up. And so you're basically taking the, bone, the body's own healing process and using that to consolidate together three vertebrae that used to be separate. So let's see what that would involve. Number one, you can't fuse an intact bone. So that means you actually have to get rid of the outer layer. And if you look at a vertebrae in, in cross section, it looks like a piece of ribrae. There's a crust, which we call the cortical bone. And then there's the inside, which is a cancellous bone. You got, you must get through the cortical bone and expose the bleeding cancellous bone to get a fusion. So we call that decortication. And decorticating the three levels, two disc spaces and three vertebrae, it's a couple hours worth of work. 
you then have to go get a bone graft. Well, there's no free lunch. So you have to take that from the patient's own ilium, which is really a separate surgery, whether you make a separate incision or reach inside and do it, but it's another whole operation. And you have to close that up. And now, because that is cancellous bone that you've removed, the place you removed it from is just bleeding like crazy. And there's nothing you're going to do to stop that. That's not a blood vessel. That's blood coming out of a sponge. And now you've decorticated the spine. So that's bleeding like crazy because that's the whole intent to get it to bleed. Right. And then you have to pack this bone across these three levels. And that won't work because people move and they breathe and they bend back and forth. The bone would never fuse. So what you have to do is you have to stabilize those three levels. And that requires massive hardwood. When I say massive, I'm not exaggerating. You talk about pedicle screws. Well, they're usually three inches long. Here's a screw. You're putting it from behind down a very narrow tube of bone all the way through the vertebral body to the front of the body on each side. So that would be six of those. You have to attach them to a plater. That's another two hours of surgery. So by the time you get done, these patients typically lost four units of blood, which you have to transfuse. Um, they've been on the operating table for six, seven, eight hours. You take them off. And they look like a dead upside down cockroach. They're stiff in that position because they've been in that position. Um, their risk of infection, uh, pulmonary embolus, and all the other post-operative complications is directly proportional to the length of time they've been under anesthesia. Um, these kinds of surgeries, because the legs are, in essence, folded up while you're doing them, have a high risk of deep venous thrombosis, which can go off and give you a pulmonary embolus. So all I'm trying to say, these are massive surgeries. And by the way, the success rate for those was somewhere around 70, 75%. So then those people who didn't do well went on to have multiple surgeries. And each time you have it, your chances are less and less. I replaced that with a surgery that takes, oh, 45 minutes through a two-inch incision. And you go home the same day or the next day, you lose no appreciable blood at all. You require almost no pain medicine. I mean, the difference is just day and night dramatic, but it was all altogether new surgery that required altogether new instruments um, and, and new implants. So none of that existed before. And in the cervical spine, I had similar kinds of changes. And usually when I invented something, it wasn't an eighth thing. It was a universal system that will allow somebody who masters the system to do multiple things with it. So that would be my answer. No, that's, that's really interesting. You, you said instead of trying to improve on what it, what was existing, kind of developing new approaches. It's, it, it, would it be fair to say you almost looked at a new way to approach something and then thought of what devices would help you more easily do that? The answer is yes, but let me say something that might be more instructive for the listener. You know that old saying, you can't make omelets without cracking eggs? Anybody can be an accidental inventor. To be a purposeful, directed, serial inventor, you need to give yourself permission to deconstruct things. You got to break stuff. You got to say, I'm not going to accept the status quo. No, I will color outside the lines. I will think outside the box. I'll think sideways. I'll think backwards. I'm not going to be constrained by what everybody else says. Hey, why are you doing it? I used to race bicycles. And, and we all had what were called foot traps. You put your foot on the pedal, it's a piece of metal, it's a leather strap, pull it tight so you can pull on the pedal as well as push on it. You ride in a tight pack. If anybody went down, everybody went down. So one day I designed a different kind of, first of all, you don't need a pedal. All you need is a spindle because the bottom of your shoe is like a piece of wood anyway. So I designed something different where your foot could snap on and snap off. I remember showing up for a ride and everybody said to me, what the hell is the matter with you? I go, well, I'm tired of falling, landing on my shoulder. They go, okay, Greg Lamont's the best in the world. Does he need that? Well, why do you need that? Nobody else uses that. You know, so the old saw about if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. Well, that's crap. There's a status quo. People are heavily invested in the status quo, and they'd rather beat you than a path to your door. That's interesting. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, as you know very well, you know, with any type of invention or when you try to change what the existing, you know, especially in medicine, which as you know very well, medicine's very slow to change. How did you deal with, you know, other physicians who maybe questioned your techniques or devices or thought, you know, why would you do that? And then essentially not only convince them it was good, but it convinced them to adopt it as well. That's, that's a, a big question. It has many facets. So 
um, I can remember oh, some of my early inventions that doctors would walk over to me and say, well, you didn't invent that. I, I, I thought of that. At the first couple of times people said that, it, it actually bothered me. And after a little while, I said, really? I said, what did you do with that great thought you had? Well, I didn't think much of it at the time, so I didn't really do anything with it. I said, okay, so then in essence, you didn't do anything to help anybody. You claim you had the same thought I did, except you did nothing with it. And would you like me to give you the credit for it now? What is it you're asking for? Okay. They never thought of it. What they're really saying is, now that I see what you've done, it seems so simple. I should have been able to think of that. That's what they were really saying. So that's the first part of it. Um, I had somebody I worked with at the hospital I worked, who he himself was a very famous spine surgeon. And um, one of the other spine surgeons there, we had more than one spine surgeon, said to him, Bob, you need to see the set of instruments that Dr. Michelson invented. And he walked by, didn't look, made himself a cup of coffee and said to the other person speaking, he goes, you know, uh, I'm, I'm Operation Dale. I, I didn't even know what that meant. So I said, Bob, what does that mean? He said, well, I'm a black belt at what I do. Why would I want to start out and be a white belt with what you do? That was his answer. So the world left him behind. The rest of the world went on to do these much smaller operations that were much more effective than the seven and eight hour operations he had been doing. That's amazing. You know, I imagine that must have taken a high amount of persistence as well. I'm curious of all your inventions, which, which one do you think made the biggest impact on spinal surgery in your opinion or, or you, or you, or was most meaningful to you? Well, you know, it's like asking artists, which painting they like the best or asking a father, which child he cares for the most. Um, clearly when I first invented surgery in the disc space and brought that to be common. So let me back up. I'm certainly not the first doctor that suggested we approach the spine from the front. I mean, people were doing tuberculosis surgery in Hong Kong and other people were talking about operating from the front. I personally did not know anybody doing adult spine surgery that was doing surgery from the front. I did scoliosis work. The scoliosis guys would do it all the time. But most people who called themselves spine surgeons, people who did spine fellowships had never seen the front of the spine. They got some scary things up there. They got the aorta and the vena cava. There's a couple of ureters hanging around. And these people are not general surgeons. So that was one of the massive, massive changes because with the things I invented, you could do a two level decompression, inner body fusion and instrumentation in 45 minutes from the front through an incision that's not more than three inches long. And here's something ironic for you. This system I invented, which is the surgery itself, the technique, the instruments to do it and the implants, I got to eat my own cook. I've had that surgery. Oh, wow. That's, that's, so, talk that's about, about full as circle. As it gets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk about full circle. That's, that's amazing. And you know what? I'll tell you something. I didn't take any pain medicine afterwards. It really was not a painful operation. So here I had a spine fusion. It wasn't a painful operation. That's amazing. I mean, that's, it's uh, all around, you know, positive wins there. I mean, you've shorter time, smaller incisions, less pain. I mean, that's, that's, that's Somebody the goal. Somebody <laughs> actually did. The guy who was the head of um, the Neurological Spine Society actually did a study with published spine where he showed the tremendous cost savings of this operation compared to what had been going on before. So when you talk about being a win, it was certainly a win for the patient. It's a win for the surgeon. He's, he's doing something in less than an hour. It used to take him seven or eight hours, getting leg cramps. Um, it was a win for the insurance company. It was a win for, the, was a win for everybody. It's a win for society. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm curious, you know, with, uh, you know, in recent years, you're good to get your thoughts on this. As you probably know, a lot of device, when people talk about devices, they're often thinking of a way to reduce costs for the healthcare system. Was that, was that something that was as focused on back when you were inventing in the, in the early days or in your career or, and was that something that would have helped move a product further along? Well, that was never a focus of mine. Making money wasn't a focus of mine. Um, but the reality was, as I said, um, this particular doctor who was the head of the neurosurgeon community I actually wrote an article. He studied it. He got the hospital billings and he showed that doing this operation was significant. It was half the price, total cost of what we had been doing. So in addition to all the other advantages, 
a one day hospital stay, stay instead of eight days. Um, you go home and move around immediately instead of being at absolute bed rest for six weeks. Time back to work was less than two months, where the other ones was six months. It just went, went on and on. It was actually hundreds of thousands of dollars of saving overall. That's amazing. I'm, I'm curious, kind of switching gears here a little bit. When you when you were inventing these devices, at what stage did you, you know, partner with an industry partner that, you know, could manufacture it and distribute it? And I'm, when you got to that stage, what did you look for in the industry partners you, you partnered up with? Because I'm sure there were many very interested people, but I'm sure picking that was was somewhat of a unique challenge in and of itself. <laughs> so let me back it up to one one moment before that. So when I had invented some instruments that I was using every day, and I had a, a, a big part of my spine practice was referrals. So other neurosurgeons and other orthopedic surgeons who had already operated on their patients and their patients did not get better. That's the time they want to refer it to somebody else and make it their problem. But once they did that, they also wanted to scrub in on those surgeries. So they would see me do these operations and use these things. And they would say, well, I want those. So at some point, uh, instead of having the machinist make one set at a time, as he explained to me, he said, look, setting up the machines to make one set at a time is more work than making the thing. I could just make you 100. And I said to him, well, what would I do with 100? He said, sell them. So I had a woman used to walk my two dogs when I was at the hospital. So at the hospital day, I said, Suzanne, how would you like to become the president of a spine company? And she started selling these things. Well, at the end of, I think, the second year, they were selling $3 million of these instruments a year. And at that time, Roy Black, who's a wonderful man, was the president of Codman Shirtleth, which was a wholly owned subsidiary of J&J and the leading seller of spine and cranial stuff in the world. And Roy said, can I come and meet with you? He, he came, he dragged a bunch of people with, to my home in California. He was up in Bedford, Massachusetts. And he said, listen, um, uh, let me be honest with you. He said, we had the largest booth for neurosurgical stuff at NAS. And the only problem is we had lots of salespeople, and no customers. And as I walked around, you had like a cloth covered table and the surgeons were six people deep. And I looked at what they were looking at, and I was blown away. I loved it. He said, how much of that stuff do you sell a year? And I asked Suzanne, and she said $3 million. He said, look, what if I guarantee to, to sell more than $3 million? Can Codman sell that stuff instead of you? Made sense to me. So I said, sure. So that was the first time uh, I got into a licensing agreement. It turns out it's J&J. Um, and then after that, uh, what I realized is, Sure, I could do it myself. And I guess if I was a one-trick pony, it might behoove me to do it myself. But I'm much better off having some huge company with 7,000 salespeople go out and sell the stuff. Now, you need some protections and some safeguards to make sure that works out for you. But here's what turned out in retrospect. I went back and looked. And over my um, career of licensing things, I ended up actually having relationships with 22 companies. Some of those were the absolute largest orthopedic and spine companies in the world. And some of them were startups that had no other product than what they licensed from me. So spine tech had nothing but my technology. It licensed from me. It had cages and stuff to put it in. I think it was three or four years after its inception, the company was sold for $600 million to Solzer. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. As a kind of segueing from that, which which I think is kind of interesting, and you touched on, I think, very briefly there, isn't the issue of intellectual property, which I know is kind of a big effort of yours recently, also to make sure to educate people about intellectual property. I guess, I guess, kind of a two part. One, how did you learn about intellectual property when you were doing this? And two, maybe tell us a little bit about the uh, Michelson Intellectual Property Institute that you've developed as well. Okay, um, so somebody listening to this will actually have a great idea and want to invent something. Then the question is, what do you do with it? Well, if you think it's the only bright idea you're ever going to have in your life, I guess you want to start a company and try to sell it. And then you're going to have to have salespeople and you're okay. But if you think you might have a second bright idea, then it might be worth your time. If you want to have time left to practice medicine to find the biggest company you can find with the most sales power and have them license the technology from you and guarantee you a certain amount of sales. 
because you don't want to license it to them and they go, you know what? We decided as a business matter, we don't want to sell that. It competes with one of our other products. So you don't want to be in that position. That's how I would proceed. Now, to do that, you could try to do that with a non-disclosure agreement. Um, if I were a company, I wouldn't accept that. Most companies won't accept that because no matter what they do after that, you're going to claim, oh, they stole the idea from me. So if I was a company, I wouldn't accept a non-disclosure. 3M was infamous that they wouldn't even let you submit something without a non-disclosure. They would have some secretary put it in a brown envelope and send it back to you and say, we want you to know nobody looked at that. They were infamous for that because they got burned. So on the other hand, everybody listening to this should know, I think it's less than $200. You can file what's called a provisional patent application. You don't need an attorney to do it. You describe in as much detail as you can your invention and you send it to the patent office. And what that does is it puts you in line so nobody can get in front of you and you have an entire year before you have to go file a real patent. And during that year, you're fully protected and you can go to any company you want and show them what you have and say, would you be interested in licensing? it?" So I think that's one of the best plays available. I appreciate that advice. I'm sure many of the listeners will as well. You know, I'm curious. I, I think like I told you, I've interviewed a number of uh, physician entrepreneurs recently, and I'm always curious, to, did you ever consider leaving medical practice to like work on inventions full time? You know, because you know, I bet, as you know, that's a very time consuming. And if you and if you never did, why, why did you continue practicing? And what was maybe the advantage of that you found? You know, Warren Buffett famously said, if somebody wasn't paying me to do this, I'd have to go figure out who to pay to let me. And um, surgeons are the most God-blessed people in the world. My brother was a cardiologist. I couldn't be a cardiologist for all the world. No <laughs> patient gets better. You're chronically sick patients for life. But I can tell you, as a spine surgeon, you can lift somebody up out of a wheelchair, return them to work to being a functioning mother, father, husband, or wife. And I mean, that is a gift to be in that position. Would I stop doing that? No, no. On the other hand, inventing something that 10,000 spine surgeons can use to help a million patients is a level of impact that you as a surgeon cannot possibly achieve. So, you know, each one has its sort of benefits. And I got to pretty much enjoy both. Now, I want to say to the people listening, that comes at a very high cost. You know, people think about money, but the cost is you only have so many hours in your life. And, and this is interesting. People think that when you talk about priority, you're going to make a list of 10 things. You do the first one and the second one, the third one. Life does not work like that. Let me impart this little piece of wisdom. That is not how things work. It's not a matter of putting them on a list and doing them in order. You're never going to get to do number two. So the cost of doing what I did, which was not to stop doing either and do both, is didn't have a family. I had a television set for, I think, less than two weeks. When I realized it was taking up my time, I gave it to a friend. Didn't go out and watch football games. I mean, you know, these things come with a price. No, that's that's understandable. I think it that's a interesting point on kind of weighing what you want out of your life and how much you're you're willing to give up for that that's that's very interesting very wise advice i'm curious to, now segueing you know to your more recent efforts since you know accumulating wealth and you know getting into philanthropy you know maybe tell us a little about i know you're very active in you know medical research uh philanthropy what what are what areas of medical research do you seek to fund with your your foundation and what are you most excited about in this turn as far as medical research uh in the years to come Okay, so Michael Milken, who's, if you're going to ask me who my hero in life is, it's Mike. Um, he taught me um, that you should never fund something that would get funded anyway. It's a waste of your money. So in medical research, we only fund things that would not otherwise get funded. Now, I don't want to make this a discourse about the shortcomings of NIH, but NIH is the major funder of academic medical research in this country and the largest funder of medical research in this country. They do not fund leaping research. What is leaping research? Well, there's an old saying that you cannot cross a chasm in three small steps. You have to leap over it. They don't fund that. They fund incremental research. So you can't get a grant unless you did the thing before it or it's already happened. Um, and so we fund things 
that NIH says, oh, oh, no, 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 that's way too dangerous. That's too high risk or um, that's too avant-garde. And so far, our track record's 100%. Everything that we have funded that they said, no, 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 it's too avant-garde, they're now funded. So we have a pretty good track record. Um, and that's part of what we do. Um, we also have, um, we have a number of foundations to do different things, but we also have what we call Center for Public Policy. And another thing that Mike Milken taught me was that government is the great lever. So if you want to cause change, that's where you want to apply pressure. And so what we've been doing, we've been working for a very long time on things like reforming the FDA, on getting more funding for NIH, for enhanced funding for uh, ARP age and things like that. And, and we've been actually... We're not the only voice, but we're one of the voices, and we've been effective. We've been able to apply leverage, and we see change. And, you know, there's a big bill up right now to reform the FDA, and that'd be monumental. That's amazing. I mean, it's, uh, you know, helping out kind of earlier stage projects that, you know, otherwise would be turned away. I think that, you know, I commend you for that. <laughs> well, now, now, now you just touched a whole nother area. <laughs> so one of our, um, one of our very specific efforts is to fund young researchers. So as a resident, you know, you're an indentured servant and you're better off than when I was, when I was a resident, you were on for 48 hours every third day and they weren't using you as a resident. They were using you as cheap labor to draw blood and do every other thing in the world to save themselves $7 an hour. It was abuse. And at the same time you had the IRS saying, Oh, well, you're not really a fellow. You're not really on a stipend. You're just a worker and taxing you as ordinary income. It was a pretty amazing situation. And I think that has gotten somewhat better, but I'm not sure how much better it's, it has gotten. So now what's happened is the cheapest, highly trained labor in the entire marketplace are PhDs, postdocs. You can hire a postdoc for $75,000 a year. Here's somebody who's spent five to seven years of their life getting there. And they can't get a grant from NIH. Why? Because they didn't have one before. And the rules, the algorithms by which those grants are issued was constructed by the old white boys club who controls it. So they are, in essence, indentured servants. And yet, if you study the people who have won the Nobel Prizes in the hard sciences, the work for which they won the prizes was, for the most part, done before the age of 35. Einstein did both his special and general theories of relativity before 35, quipped on his 35th birthday. If you haven't done it by now, you're not going to do it and proved himself right in the rest of his life. So we have two different areas in which we fund young investigators and we invite them to do high risk, high returns research with the expectation they won't succeed. That's perfectly OK. And, and we give them $150,000 each to do the research they want to do. They, they're all brilliant people. They have a, let me tell you the characteristics. You'll like this. There are six characteristics that you need to be a successful serial inventor. And it turns out they're the exact same six to be a great scientist. So number one, you do need intellect. It helps to be bright. Number two, you need some specific knowledge. Now in days gone by, you could invent something by being a self-educated person in physics or electronics or whatever, but you do need some knowledge. You need imagination. You need permission. You need permission to not accept the status quo, to color outside the lines, to think outside the box, to take stuff apart. A lot of people don't have that by the time they go through our school systems. That's been beaten out of them. You need daring because what, you, what you're about to do has never been done before. And everybody around you is going to tell you, why would you try to do that? What are you doing? You're not going to get support. People deride you for the fact that you're going to do this. And then the last thing you touched on this, and the most important is you need perseverance. So if you give up, then you have failed. If what you do at first does not succeed, but you don't give up, then it's just an iterative process, and it's just a step along the way, and you succeed. That's an interesting thought. I think, well, I think it was Edison that said, uh, I didn't f fail a thousand times. I found a thousand ways that the light bulb didn't work. So that's uh, very interesting. And I, those characteristics you, you bring up, I think that's 
interesting the parallels you draw between being a scientist, which is in some ways an inventor. You're discovering new ways or new ways of thinking about things or discovering completely new, you know, areas of science and concepts that we never thought of before. Um, so that's amazing. I'm curious, have you, have you, uh, focused at all, uh, on any new, like early inventors or, or early like device, uh, developers through your foundation? I really have not run a competition for inventors. We run two different competitions by which we fund and reward and give prizes to early medical researchers. And, uh, of late, we're particularly interested in immunology. And um, I don't know whether you want me to go into that or not, but that's pretty much where we're focused right now. Interesting. Yeah, immunology is such a fascinating field. Is, that, is it kind of immunotherapeutics or is it even more broad than that? So the question itself begs the issue. So if you were to turn to any physician and say immunotherapy, they're thinking cancer therapy because immunology has applied to therapy, has revolutionized cancer. But the truth of the matter is that anything that you do to manipulate the immune system to either prevent, treat, or cure a disease is immunotherapy. So all the vaccines you've ever had, we're all immunotherapy. When you take an antibiotic, that's immunotherapy. I mean, but the problem is we've been so successful in cancer that we've made immunotherapy narrow to where it's cancer therapy. The truth is your immune system is the common denominator to every disease that will possibly kill you, whether it's COVID or it's heart disease or it's Alzheimer's. It's, it's the com- it's, it is the agent of aging. We all, I love this, we all think that we age because time goes by. Time just happens to be out there happening. We age because our own immune systems are attacking our own tissues every day. It's aggregated chronic inflammation. That is destroying our tissues. That's amazing. You know, I, I remember when I was a, I think a first year medical student, I worked in a lab for a summer that did um, like the tumor microenvironment. And they looked at like the immune, the immune systems involvement in the tumor. And, you know, as a naive first year medical student, you know, I just knew about B and T cells and some of the other things they make us memorize. And it kind of opened my eyes to really how the amazing role of the immune system, as you described, plays in so many. I mean, I had never even thought of that, like immune system plays such a critical role in us, it protects us from cancer, but then it also can, as you said, you know, lead to us acquiring cancer, unfortunately. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the, the more um, interesting thing is how remarkable these cancer cells are. Because when I went to medical school, the teaching was, well, cancer cell is just a stupid cell. It's something that's lost the internal controls over reproduction. It's just reproducing crazy. But the truth is, to be a successful cancer generally requires somewhere between 300 and 500 separate mutations. And people don't understand that the genetic sequence of their tumors is not the same as theirs. And to put an exclamation point on what you're talking about, there's now a recently published article that shows how the neutrophils that are engaging these cancer cells enter into the cancer cell's microenvironment and are actually converted by the cancer cell into blockers as if it was like a football game, and they're now the offensive blockers. They're doing the exact opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. They've been reprogrammed by the cancer's microenvironment. I mean, it's inc- the, the, the cancer cells are telling the host what to do. They're saying, hey, come on here, grow in some more blood vessels. Do this, do that. It's really incredible. Yeah, the complexity is amazing. And uh, again, I, I commend you and your, your foundation for you know funding this really critical research. Uh, to close things out, we, we ask every guest this when you're not working on uh, philanthropy or, or inventing, what, how do you unwind outside of your work? Well, that's funny because uh, if I turned around right now, you'd see I've got like stitches up and down my shoulder on my back. Um, I was out in the back throwing axes. That's actually oh, wow. a thing now. And uh, I had this one ax that looks like it was for slaying uh, dragons. It's got this real long claw at the back, razor sharp. And I cocked it through it and it went right through my own shoulder. So that's what I do for fun. That's fun. And the other thing which I spend most of my time on right now, though, is building this center for immunology and immunotherapy um, at UCLA. We've been working on that for four years. And the state of California has very generously given us $500 million towards that effort. UCLA threw in a piece of land that I think is worth a billion dollars. We've got donors for another $500 million. And this will be the leading center in the world for immunology and immunotherapy writ large, broadly. 
That's amazing. Uh, Dr. Michelson, you know, as we wrap up here, I just want to say thank you for your time. And then also more importantly, thank you for everything you've done for, you know, humanity. I mean, just from all throughout your career with spine surgery and then now with immunotherapy and all your other uh, philanthropic efforts. So thank you again. Really appreciate it. Max, thank you for your time. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Da Vinci Hour podcast presented by Da Vinci Academy. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your podcast platform of choice to catch the latest episodes. Please leave a comment or review and share it with a friend. Lastly, you can find all of our podcasts, video courses, and books on our website, dviacademy.com. Thank you for listening.